So here's the idea. Um, the idea is that um, we have functions that uh, extend to uh, infinity and beyond. So uh, for example, we have fu a function like you know, 1 over x is an example of a function that if you graph it, well, it looks kind of like this, right? And so, um, you know, this function keeps going on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Um, and so if you want to find the area under the curve as it extends over here forever, uh, you might say, well, oh, well, the area, if it keeps going on forever, then the area must be infinite, right? That's what your intuition would tell you. Uh, but actually, in reality, uh, not necessarily. So it could be that it, uh, the area is infinite, um, but it could also, um, it could also be an actual number. So you know, just because you're at, you keep adding more and more to something, doesn't mean that um, it's going to get infinitely bigger. So like, I mean, a really simple example is if you, um, you know, let's say you take a um, a uh, a half step, and then I add another half step, and then another half step, and then another half step. Will I? So you're always adding, right? A half step, mm -hmm. but am I ever going to go off to infinite distance? Yeah. No, right? Because you're always adding half of that step that you took, right? Mm -hmm. So like you take a half step, and so then you take another half step, and then so you're always you'll never actually reach a certain point. Think about it. Just take a very long time. Yeah, a very long time, right? Very, exactly. Very long time. Infinite amount of time, infinite. but not infinite distance, right? Yeah. So that's the idea. Okay. So these integrals are called improper. So let's um, let's define it. So okay. So um, suppose let's do. Uh, all right, so suppose um, f of x is integral, integrable on the interval from a to b, um, where uh, b is greater than a. So it's so it's integrable on any uh, closed interval. Um, from a to b, where b is bigger than, than a. Um, then uh, we define uh, the improper integral, uh, the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from a to r of f of x dx. So, and I mean, this makes sense, right? Um, so basically what you have is you take the um, integral, leaving r as uh, a variable, and then you just take the limit as that um, the top limit of integration goes to infinity, right? That makes sense, yes? Okay, so any questions with that? So let's try this for that function um, that we start off on. Let's say we have the integral from one to infinity of one over x. All right, so before we do it, what do you guys think? It's going to be a number or infinite? Don't know. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> All right, so this is equal to the limit. All right, so we say this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to r of 1 over x dx. And so this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of, what's the antiderivative? Mm -hmm. So ln of absolute value of x evaluated from 1 
to r. So this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of natural log of r minus natural log of 1. And what is that? ln of 1 is 0. zero. And then what's the limit as r goes to infinity? Where does natural log of r go? Where does the natural log function go? It just keeps going, right? Yeah. To infinity. So it's kind of slow, right? But the natural log function, so the natural log function looks like, like this, right? But it keeps, so it goes up to infinity pretty slow, but it goes up to infinity, right? So this is equal to infinity, right? Yes or no? That, so this limit, the limit as r goes to infinity of natural log of r, this part, natural log of 1 is just 0. But the natural log function goes to infinity, so that's equal to infinity. Yes? Does that make sense? Yes? Does it matter if it's just going like infinity on the x and y axis? Is that what well, no, what, yeah, what you're looking at is, so, um, so here this would represent the, you know, the x-axis, this represents um, r, right? So you're looking at, as r goes to infinity, your function, the y value of your function goes to, um, is going towards infinity, right? Okay, so what we say here is that, um, when it goes to infinity, we say that um, the improper integral diverges. So right here, we should actually let's let's add that in. Um, mm, let me do it over here a little bit. Um, if I forgot to put that in, maybe I'll fit it in right here. So if this limit exists. If this limit exists, we say the integral converges. Otherwise, uh, it diverges. So, you know, basically if this limit is equal to an actual number, then we say that it converges. If it um, is equal to infinity or negative infinity, then it diverges. Okay, so let's do, so then you say, aha, that's what I knew all along, right? Right? It's like, oh, I told you so. Well, let's do another one. How about if we have... 1 over x squared. Does the same thing happen? Yeah. Well, plus 2. So let's take a look. So let's write it out. So this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to r. And then let's write it as, instead of 1 over x squared, why don't we just write it as x to the negative 2. Um, so then what's the, uh, what's the antiderivative there? Um, close, almost 1 over x, negative, negative 1 over x. Okay, so this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of, so I'll just plug in top minus bottom, right? So negative 1 over r minus negative 1 over 1, right? So just plug in top minus bottom. And, hmm, interesting. Uh, what is this? What is that? Oh, yeah, that's going to zero. That's going to zero, right? This integral is going towards zero. Um, and what about this other part? Uh, positive one. One. Yep. The number one. So what this says is that, 
So let's let's draw a little picture. Do you guys remember what one over x squared looks like? Roughly? Kind of sort of? Um. Kind of sort of? Kind of sort of like No? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. Um kind of looks like ah some like this and then I mean it looks very similar to 1 over x except that um, these are make-believe bumps, they're not real bumps. But, uh, but they're both, so it's always positive, right, even when x is negative. Uh, but what this is saying is that if you find the area under the curve from 1 all the way over here to, and you keep going forever and ever and ever, you keep going, keep going, keep going. The area under that, as this curve goes to infinity, is the number 1. Crazy, huh? Yeah, craziness. Who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk it? So, questions? Justin, you look like you have a question. I always look like that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's your... All right. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> okay, so let's um, let's talk about the um, so using this idea, let's talk about the p integral. The p integral is a very important. Um, we're going to use it a lot, and basically all it is is just um, we want to. Um, figure out just in general what is the integral from 1 to infinity um, of 1 over x to the p. In other words, we want to figure out, okay, if this is any number, you know, 1, 2, 3, well, we already know from 1 and 2, right? But if it's 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, whatever it is, um, can we find, uh, figure out when, for what values that integral converges and diverges? Um, and then so that we have that and we can use it uh, over and over again. Okay, so what would we do? First is? Yes, right, it is a limit, correct? So there's the limit as r goes to infinity of the integral from 1 to r of 1 over x to the p dx, okay? Hmm, I kind of don't like this color very much. Okay, so this is equal to the limit as r goes to infinity of, what's the antiderivative? So this is the same as x to the negative p, right? So then you, negative x. So negative p plus one, is it okay if I write it one minus p instead? So negative p plus one, one minus p, divided by, 1 minus p, right? Okay, and this is evaluated from 1 to r. Okay, so let's plug it in. Um, so this is equal to uh, the limit as r goes to infinity of um, r to the 1 minus p over 1 minus p. Uh, minus 1 to the 1 minus p. What is 1 to any power? One. One. Okay, 1 minus p. So this is the limit that we're, that we're analyzing. So what we're trying to look at is, okay, so um, for what values of p does this expression right here Converge or diverge. So um, we already know. So, like, this is just sort of a side note for us. We know that it converges for for what? One. Converges for p equal to. We just did an one. example. One any number. Mm -hmm. No, what was the one that we did that it converged when p was 2, right? 
from P converges for P equals to 2. And we know already that it diverges for yeah, for P equals to 1. OK, so then what you're looking at is you're looking at, OK, so this number, this number R, that's going to infinity. So why don't we look at, um, so we know it diverges for r equals to 1. So what's going on with, with this, uh, this number? Um, for values of p, um, you know, let's say values of p that are less than 1. So let's, let's talk about that. So let's say if p is less than 1, then what happens? What happens to r to the 1 minus p? So this is less than 1, right? So, you know, so imagine 0, uh, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative R gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Mm -hmm. Because, so R is going to infinity, but what's happening to the exponent? Mm -hmm. It's not getting smaller, right? Constructing negative values and there's constructing larger. Because, so if, so P is less than one, right? So when P is one, this is zero, zero right? So if you go less than one, then this is Right. So then, so it's a positive number, right? Right. So then, if r is going to infinity and the exponent is positive, the whole thing is getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, right? Does that make sense? So if p is less than one, then r to the one minus t approaches infinity as r goes to infinity. So what does that tell you about the integral? Mm -hmm. So the integral diverges for p less than 1, right? Does that make sense? Oh my goodness. So the integral diverges for p less than uh, one, and we already know that diverges for p equals to one. So then, let's take a look at um, if p is greater than one. Then what happens? What do you notice about the exponent? Let's go um, one level sort of lower. What happens to one minus p? So if p is greater than one, then one minus p is. 1 minus p is? Mm -hmm. It's negative, right? So if 1 minus p is negative, that means that the exponent of r is negative, which means that it's really a fraction, right? And so as r goes to infinity, then that fraction is going to be going towards 0, right? Does that make sense? So 1 minus p is less than 0, so um, r to the 1 minus p approaches 0 as r goes to infinity. Does that make sense? OK. So that's if p is greater than 1. OK, so then this means, so let's, so then if, um, so if p is greater than 1, then the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the p dx is equal to, um, let's write it out again, limit as r goes to infinity of r to the 1 minus p over 1 minus p minus 1 over 1 minus p. And that is equal to, so we just said this goes to 0, right? So what's left over? Negative 1 
over 1 minus p, or also known as 1 over p minus 1, right? So that's the exact number that you get um, that the integral is equal to for values of p greater than 1. And notice that um, the case that we just did for p equals to 2, what happens when you plug in p equals to 2? You get 1. 1, right? Isn't that exactly what we got? So if you had, for example, the integral uh, from 1 to infinity of 1 over x cubed, that would be, what would it equal to? 1 half. 1 half, right? That's 1 over 3 minus 1, so 1 half. Yes? Oh, sorry, yes, yes, yes. Sorry. I need to see that. If p is greater than 1. <laughs> um, okay, so any questions with that integral? So this one, we, we use this a lot when we're using the um, comparison test, which we will see in a bit. But, uh, but yeah, it's really important and useful, and it pops up again when we do infinite series later on as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the the problem, the first problem, this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, uh, I don't get why the integral is infinity from one to the other one, but the graphs are kind of the same. So one to the um. Yeah, I mean they're they they're similar, but they don't. Basically what it is, and we're going to see this in more detail later, is that so the graphs look similar. So like this is 1 over x squared. And 1 over x looks similar, at least from 1 to infinity. That's what you're saying? That they look so similar, then why does this one diverge and this one converge? Yeah, basically what it is is that um, 1 over x squared, the, the function, it goes to 0 uh, faster than this one does. It's kind of like this one goes to, and we're going to look at this in much more detail when we do um, um, sequences and series, but what you need for it to converge, you basically need it to go to 0 fast enough. So fast enough doesn't really mean much right now, but um, this one, 1 over x squared. Um, so if you think about plugging in numbers into um, 1 over x squared, so you plug in a number, like let's say 1,000, right? So this is 1 over 1,000 squared. Well, that's 1 over a million. That's small, right? So where at the same point where 1 over x squared, this one is 1 over a million. This one is 1 over 1,000. So this one isn't going to zero fast enough for it to converge, meaning that every step you take, you, you're you adding a significant amount to where it's always going to keep growing and growing and growing. So it's kind of like the idea of, you know, even though 1 over x, this one is going towards zero, um, it's going to zero too slow so that you're always keep adding and adding and adding and adding more and more and more. So that area is infinity and the other one's just this one down here is infinity, and this one is the number one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is, it is a little uh, nutty, a little crazy. I agree. That's hard to. Yeah, I, it, it is difficult. I agree. Um, yeah, we're, uh, yeah, you can say it's math magic, at least for now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> On the bottom graph, what would be the shaded portion? <laughs> um, it would be. Yeah, this. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, they, this is a this is, yeah, this is a rough sketch. I mean, they don't, they're not really the same, same. You know, it's just they look the same. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like that one could be infinity still, though, because the bottom one, it could be a big number, but if the other one, then. The bottom one's infinity, the top one would have to be because you keep taking half steps. 
you'd still never get there on the bottom one. Yeah, they both actually go into infinity. The one is just going there quicker. Right. The one is going to infinity to the point where you're standing still and it's not really doing anything. But so you can, you can yeah, I mean, this, so this area right here is approaching the number uh, one. This area right here, that's going towards uh, infinity. Yeah. I mean it's yeah. There's some uh some some uh you know good uh theory missing there because we haven't done sequences in series but we'll get there. But we'll get there. Yeah. That's the meat. The meat and potatoes of the class. Great times. Great times kind of, of meat and potatoes. Person. What is it? Kind of a rice person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions about this so far? No? <laughs> okay. Um, well, then, let's see here. How about we. Okay. So there's another type of improper integral, um, and that is at uh, infinite. Infinite discontinuities. Huh. So, for example, let's uh, bring back our log function. So, um, this has an infinite discontinuity right here at uh, zero, right? So, like if you want to find the um, the integral from zero to one of natural log of x dx. You can't use the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus because it's not uh, continuous there. So you apply the same general idea. You just uh, take the limit as you approach that number. So uh, let's write. So let's write that down. So that's the idea. Um, so let's see here. Oh, all right. So suppose uh, F is continuous on the interval from A to B. Um, But not necessarily at, well, but not at B. Then the integral from um, A to B of f of x dx is equal to the limit as r approaches B. From what direction would we approach B? If we're going from A to B. From the left side, right? So for limit as R approaches B from the left of the integral from A to R of f of x dx. And then um, so and then the idea applies the same way if it's continuous from, well, let's write it down. So let's just say, let's see, okay. So similarly, if uh, F is continuous on the integral, the interval from A to B, so this is not at A, but yes, at B. Then the integral from A to B of f of x dx is equal to the limit as x approaches A. From what direction? Oh, sorry. Not x. Ooh, Cramini's crickets. Jiminy's crickets, too. Okay, so the limit as r approaches a from the 
right of the integral from r to b of f of x. So which one applies in that example that I made up? Contin discontinuous on the left side or discontinuous on the right side? The left side, right? Because it's discontinuous over here at zero. OK, so let's apply it to this problem, see if we can figure it out. Um, ooh. All right, so then this, the integral from 0 to 1 of natural log of x is equal to uh, the limit as r approaches to whatever is con discontinuous, right? Where is it discontinuous? 0, right? So the limit as r approaches 0 from the right, right of the integral from r to 1 of ln of x dx. OK. Um, and then this is equal to the limit as r approaches 0 of, um, what's the antiderivative of ln of x? Which one? The antiderivative of 1 over x is ln of x. It does have an x. X ln of x minus minus x. Oh, you guys forgot already. How did you? How did we find that one? Do you guys remember? Yeah, integration by parts. Um, you let u be ln of x, and then dv is dx. Okay, so this is equal to the limit. As r goes to 0 of, um, so we plug in 1, right? So 1 times ln of 1 minus 1 uh, minus, let's put it like that, minus r ln of r, ooh, minus r, right? No. Mm. What, where's my mistake? There's a mistake. Plus r, right? So it's minus plug in r, but you have to distribute the negative sign, so this should be a plus. So you've got to be careful with your signs. OK. So what do we get? OK. So the first one is 0. OK, um, minus 1. Um, and then we've got, what's going on with this one? What's that? That's 0, right? Because r is approaching 0, so this is going to 0. What about that one? Ooh. Coming from the right, right? Sorry. Forgot to put those there. I put it here, but I forgot to put it there. So it's a limit as r approaches zero from the right of r ln of r. What is that? Zero. What? Right. No. <laughs> That's not times zero. Natural this is zero. zero times. What? Where is natural log going as r approaches um, zero from the right? Um, Negative infinity, right? So this is zero times. Negative infinity, which is, is what? Zero. No, it's not zero. It's <laughs> zero times infinity is. It's why do you wash the colons? Uh, 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 the thingy. Indeterminate. Yeah, it's an indeterminate form. Zero times infinity. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <coughs> All right, so then we do a side note over here somewhere. OK. All right, so the limit as r approaches 0 from the right of r, ln of r is indeterminate. OK, so what do we do? Got 
What do we use? There you go, L'Hopital's rule. Did you guys re review your L'Hopital's rule? Uh -huh. Using the stuff that I sent you? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, so. Okay, so to be able to use L'Hopital's rule, what do I have to do? Turn the zero to zero and infinity over infinity. Okay, so you have to decide which one to move to the bottom. Which one would you guys like to move to the bottom? Natural log of R. Really? Really? You want to move natural log of R to the bottom? No, let's move the R to the bottom. Okay, so. Alright, so we'll move the R to the bottom. Thank you, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> so when we move it to the bottom, this is R to the negative 1, right? Okay, so using L'Hopital's rule. So the reason why I can use L'Hopital's rule is because I have. What is this? Top it's going to infinity, the bottom is going to yeah. infinity, right? Because it's r to the negative one is really one over r. So if you have one over the denominator is going to zero, then the whole thing is going up to infinity, right? Okay. So L'Hopital's rule says one over r. Okay. So drew it to the top, which is one over r. And then the derivative of the bottom, which is? Negative r over negative 2. Okay, or negative 1 over r squared, right? Mm -hmm. And if you invert and multiply and all mm -hmm. kinds of fun stuff, you get that. What do you get there? Negative r. So negative r, and then so this is equal to? Zero. So you guys are right. But you were lucky. <laughs> <laughs> it's not always zero. Okay, so um, so then this is going towards zero. So then, what's the only thing left over? Negative one. That's the area under. And why is it negative? Where's my graph here? There it is. It's right there, right? All that right there. That is negative one. As you get. Cool stuff? Questions? Yes. So it's the area. Well, because remember the area underneath the x-axis is negative, yeah. Because that's how, because it's defined as, so remember when we um, derive the um, area underneath the curve, we use the um, Riemann sums. And so you had the rectangles, right? So all the rectangles and all that kind of good stuff. The rectangle, the height of the rectangle comes from the value of the function at the specific point. And so since the function is negative down here, well then the, you would add up the negative height and so then it would always be negative. Okay, so um, sometimes you have an integral that you, we already learned, that you can't evaluate, right? Can you evaluate all integrals? All functions are integral. <laughs> so, okay, so we, we um, we can make use of the, it's called the um, uh, comparison test. Wow. Okay. So the comparison test basically says, um, so here, well, let's write down the idea and then um, write down the idea and then um, let's draw a picture of the idea and then we'll, we'll write it down. So let's say you have two functions. Um, let's say this is f of x and then you have another function that is g of x. Okay, so the idea is that 
Um, suppose, um, let's say that you know f of x is always greater than or equal to g of x, which it is in the picture, right? So you can see that f is always bigger than g. And then suppose that you know that. And then um, suppose you also know that, um, let's do from a to infinity of f of x. Suppose you know that the larger function the integral from a to infinity of the larger function, suppose you know that that converges. Then what could you say about the smaller function? It's also going to converge. It would also have to converge, right? So if the bigger function, so this function f is always bigger than g, and you know that the bigger function converges, well then the one that's always smaller than it has to converge, right? Does that make sense? Just the idea of it? Okay, so all right. So then, so then the integral from a to infinity of g of x dx converges. Okay, so now using the same idea, suppose you know that. Um, well, I won't write it down this time, but I'll just, I'll just. Um, Stated. Let's say you know that g of x, the smaller one, diverges. So if the smaller function diverges, let's say you know that, then what would you be able to say about the bigger function? Also diverges, right? Because if the one that's always smaller, if g is always smaller than f, and g diverges, then f is also going to diverge, right? Okay, now, so we'll write this down in a minute, but then um, let's say that, for example, you know that, um, okay, so let's say you have the same situation, but then we won't write this down because we already have a bunch of stuff here, but let's say, you know, g of x converges the smaller one. Let's say g of x converges. Does that tell you anything about the bigger function converging? No. No, right? Because just because a smaller function converges doesn't mean, doesn't mean the bigger one converges. If the bigger one converges, then definitely the smaller one, but not the other way around. Does that make sense? So, you know, it's only if, there, if the bigger one converges, the smaller one com also converges. If the smaller one diverges, then the bigger one also diverges. Yes? The idea is there? OK. All right, so then let's write it down. OK. So let's see. Um, so the comparison test, so suppose, oh. let's write it down, comparison test. Uh, having trouble here today. Okay, so suppose um, f of x is greater than or equal to g of x and greater than or equal to zero for um, for all x greater than a where a is some some undisclosed number then if okay so we have two two points here let's call this one a so if the integral of from a to infinity of, what was the first one? If f of x dx, what? Converges. If 
the integral from a to infinity of f of x converges, then what do we know about the integral from a to infinity of g of x? Also converges. Okay. And then if um, the integral from a to infinity of g of x diverges, then what? Okay, so then f also diverges. Diverges. Okay. Thumbs up. All right. So then, what do we say? Starts with the P. Second words I. Starts with an I. Prove it. Prove it. Yeah, you gotta <laughs> prove it. Oh. Okay. So we've gotta prove it. Ah. Oh, roll up our sleeves, get to work. Okay, so before we can prove it, we need to state a, um, a fundamental, the fundamental, and especially your book doesn't even prove it. Oh, it's terrible, okay. terrible omission. It's not even that bad. It's great times. Okay, fundamental property of uh, the real numbers. Fundamental property of the real numbers. We're going to use this, so we're not going to prove this, but we're going to later on take analysis. You will. Great times. Okay, so suppose um, and this might seem really obvious, but it actually isn't. So suppose <coughs> f is non-decreasing non-decreasing um, non-decreasing for all uh, x greater than a, where a is some number, then two things have to happen. Then either uh, the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is equal to infinity or the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x is equal to some number L. So if it's not decreasing for all x values greater than some number then it has to either go up to infinity or converge to some number we'll call it L. Maybe we should call it a different number. Hmm. Well, that's okay. We can call it L. Okay, so that might seem kind of obvious, but we'll, uh, that's okay. Okay, um, now, so we're going to, let's prove um, A, and maybe we'll leave, maybe I'll, we'll leave B for some other time. So we want to show, so here's the thing we want to show. Um, so, with, so when you're doing, how many of you guys have extensive experience doing proofs? <laughs> okay, well then you're gonna learn. So that's why you're here, right? To learn things. So, okay, so basically what you have is you have uh, one or two or more assumptions, basically. And so you use those assumptions and you want to get to the, uh, the results. So right here you have, your assumptions are um, that f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, and they're both positive, for all x greater than a. Um, and then your other assumption is that the integral from a to infinity of f of x dx converges. And what are we trying to show? If we're having those two assumptions, then we have to show that then the integral from a to infinity of g of x dx converges. Does that make sense? Our sort of path? Okay. So we can use this, we can use this, and then we wrote this down right here, so we are probably going to use that eventually. So, okay. All right, so you guys have that down, right? I'm trying to see where I can go so that I... Okay. 
So I don't have it here anymore because I need all this all the space I can get. But so you guys have it on your notebook. Okay. So we're going to suppose so we have to assume that the integral from a to infinity of f of x uh, dx is equal to some number. So suppose this uh, converges, right? So if it converges, we'll ask to converge to something. So let's call it L. L. Hmm. Well, we called the other one L. I. I. Really? I. That's a weird. That's a weird letter to pick. Like Asian I, like like that. Canada. Canada. What? <laughs> Canada. No. Let's. Okay. How about C? No C for a constant because it converges to a constant. No. Maybe I shouldn't have even asked. I should have just said C. <laughs> okay. So it converges to um, C, and it's very helpful. Very very helpful that to write down what you're trying to show. Otherwise, you're just lost and figuring out what in the world you're trying to do. So we want to show, um, we want to show uh, that um, the integral from a to infinity, whoa, g of x dx, they moved on me. Um, converges. And then I, I think it's also helpful to, um, especially when you're starting out, to write down what you know. Like, what else do you know? So we were just talking about it earlier, but let's write it down again. We also know that, um, um, what do we know? f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, and these are both positive, right? Okay, all right. So then using those two things, um, then we can start making uh, statements, and hopefully they lead to, in the end, that the integral from a to infinity of g of x dx converges. Okay, any ideas? semi mimic it a little bit. Okay, let me help you guys get started. Let's, um, so because of, of, okay, so because of the fact that f of x is greater than or equal to g of x, um, then what can you say about the integral um, from a to infinity of g of x dx. What can we say about that? Less than, less than c. Aha. Well, it's less than or equal to the integral from a to infinity of f of x, right? Mm -hmm. This is obvious because the function is going to be less than the, the function less than so the integral is going to be Yeah, f is bigger than g, than, right? Yeah. So the area under the curve of f has to be the greater than the area under the curve of g. And these are both positive, right? So thumbs up there. And this is equal to c. c. So uh, this integral right here is uh, what you're saying here is that it's always less than or equal to c, which is another, what's another way of saying that? It is, so, so the b ends with a d. No. Big word. Yes, it's bounded. Okay, so it's bounded by C. That means it can't no. go past. We're actually oh. going to use yes. this term If we were to write it as integrals, from A to R is going to be a function, and a function is bounded by another one. Oh. But then we don't. Oh, no, we can't. Because it's we don't have a bounded from yeah. below. Yeah. Below, yeah. Got a bounded from below. Okay, so we know that. Um, it's less than or equal to C. Um, okay, so it's bounded, yes? Okay, then what else do we know? 
Well, um, we also know uh, that um, uh, the integral from a to r of g of x dx is what do we know about this integral? As r increases, what happens to that integral? Yeah, it's yeah, it's non-decreasing, right? Yeah. So it's because why is that? Because g is positive. Because g is positive, right? So because g is positive, then as r increases, then this integral is always it's non-decreasing, right? So this integral is non non-decreasing. Oh. And I think, I think we've got it. Because then what can we use? We just wrote it down by the, uh, since it's non-decreasing, then the by the fundamental property of the real numbers, either, oh, snap, then by the, fundamental property, oh, shoot, property of the real numbers, F, P, R, N, um, the limit as R goes to infinity of A to the R of G of X dx is either what? What is it either? Is either um, infinity or um, some number L, because that's what we called it when we wrote it down, right? Right, because this is a non-decreasing function, so it's non-decreasing. So then it either blows up to infinity, or it approaches some number. Okay, but then what? Which one is it? Some number. We know it can't go to some infinity number because it's dotted by m. There you go. That's yeah. That's it. See, that wasn't that bad. Okay, so. Um, by the fundamental probability of real numbers, the limit um, is either infinity or some number L. But um, we know oh, that it is bounded by by Ah, oh my gosh. Bounded by C. So it must, it must what? It must converge. And that's it. Good stuff, huh? So, you know, so basically what we did is, so let's go back and kind of walk through it again. Um, so we had that, um, we supposed that um, the integral of f of x converged, right? And we also, um, uh, we also knew that f is greater than g and they're both greater than zero. And we wanted to show that g converges. So our first statement was just comparing the two integrals and we know that since, so in this first statement we used we use this fact, right? To, that led me to that, right? You guys agree? So this statement, this assumption led me to the fact that the integral is bounded by C. And then um, we know that this function, we can call this something, I don't know, maybe capital F of R. So this is a function of capital R. Ah. Um, since that's 
since g of x is positive, then this function is non-decreasing, right? As a function of r. Um, so then by the fundamental property of the real numbers, the limit is, as r goes to infinity, of this function, capital F of r, is either infinity or some number l. But it can't be infinity because we already know that it's bounded by c. That's the maximum it could be, c. So it's not infinity, so then that means it has to be some number l. So then, oops. Good times, huh? Yeah, totally. OK. All right, so um, let's do some examples. Let's see. Where, oh, I'm running out of board space here. Let's see. Right here. OK. So let's use some examples. Um, how is what possible? You ran out of board space on computer. I know. Well, I can always create more board space. But for now, the size that I've chosen is not an unlimited size whiteboard. So, um, so we're going to use the uh, comparison test. Comparison test. And notice I skipped part B, but we'll maybe do it later. Or I'll give it to you guys as a homework. It's way shorter than the other one. Use the comparison test to um, to determine convergence. Uh, okay. Okay. So before I give you an example, um, this is a super important fact. Very important. Um, if A and C are positive, then I think it's obvious that A plus C is greater than A. Yes? Mm -hmm. Super obvious, right? OK, good. All right. Now, if A is greater than B, then 1 over A is less than 1 over b, right? All right, so those two we're going to use a lot. So I just want to make sure you know, point that out. OK. All right, so we've got, let's say, the integral from, let me see, which one do I got? From 1 to infinity, I wrote some down here, 1 over the square root of x to the fifth plus Two. Okay, so the idea behind it is that um, we have the, usually what, it, what we use is that we have the p integral, which we um, know converges, so you know, 1 over x to the p converges if p is, do you guys remember? We just did it. Greater than 1 and diverges if p is less than or equal to 1, right? OK, so what you do is you get your function. You try to, um, usually you try to compare it with a p integral because that one's easy. You already know whether it um, converges or not. So like right here, if you look at this, this function, it's 1 over the square root of x to the fifth plus 2. So you, you look at it and you grab the dominant term. What's the dominant term? The x to the fifth, right? So this is, so let's forget about this for a, a second. So x to the fifth, so this is square root of x to the fifth, which is the same as x <coughs> to the five halves, right? So then you go, okay, well, then I can maybe compare it to the p integral, one over x to the five halves, which is a convergent or divergent? Convergent, convergent right? p integral, because five halves is greater than one, right? right. So what you do is you, su you say you suspect that it converges. So then um, what you do is you try to use the comparison test, right? OK. So you start off and you go, OK, so this is why, what, um, so this is sort of in your thought process. You're, you say to yourself, OK, I'm going to compare with um, this integral, uh, 1 over x to the 5 halves. 
dx. Okay, and since this one converges, then um, so okay, all right. So let's let's start up. So usually, what you do is you start off with um, with it in the numerator. So you go okay. So the square root of x to the fifth plus two is uh, what compared to square root of x to the fifth? It's greater than, right? That's the first thing that we wrote down, right? So this one's obviously bigger than this one, right? Okay, and then what is that, Ernie? Like Im implies. Okay. Implies. <laughs> it doesn't mean equals. All right. So this implies that 1 over the square root of x to the fifth plus 2 is what compared to 1 over square root of x to the fifth? Less than. Less than, right? OK. And so uh, let me see. Let me go down. And since the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over the square root of x to the fifth dx is a convergent or divergent? Convergent. Convergent p integral. Right? You guys agree? So is my inequality the correct inequality? Is that what I wanted? What do I have? I have that the <coughs> this function is greater than mine, right? Greater than the one that I'm looking for. And I know that the greater one converges, so that means that the the lesser one, one also has to converge. So then the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over the square root of x to the fifth plus 2 dx uh, converges by the, by the what? Comparison test, yeah. By the comparison test. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Questions? 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 What are you thinking, Sal? Oh. Just soaking it in, letting it, <laughs> letting it soak in. Um, But does that make sense, though? I'm just trying to figure out. So you just chose to use the x to the fifth as opposed to simply. I'm just trying to figure out. Did you just come up with that, or where did that come from? Did I come up with what part of it? The term of the game. What part are you wondering if, if it's the integral part? Yeah, how did you Wait, which one? The two comparative integrals. Yeah, how yeah. did you decide that that was like a good choice for that? This one? Yeah. Oh, because so um, the so the p integrals um, are, so we have, we know that it converges and diverges for all values, right? So we know what values it uh, converges and diverges for. So it's a great candidate to compare to because you always know if it um, converges or not. So if you look at the integral that you're trying to uh, find, then um, you, you look at the, uh, the dominant terms, the ones that are really going to affect what's going on with the function as uh, x goes to infinity, because that's really what matters, is what happens when x is large. Okay, so you just ignore the concept. Comparable to that, but at some point the constant just doesn't—it doesn't matter, right? So 
Right, so it all depends on being able to make this a comparative analysis. So you have to be able to go from um, you know, what you have, you have to be able to find a function that's greater, um, but then not only a function that's greater, but also um, it, that a function that's greater and that is convergent. Yeah? If I had a function of x5, x to the fifth uh, plus x plus 2, could I take up the x as well? OK, so excellent question right there. Excellent, excellent question. Let's say we put in an x right there. Um, so then to be able to use the same analysis, this would have to be true right there. Right? That x to the fifth plus 2x, is that greater than the square root of x to the fifth? Yeah. 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 Depends what the value of x is. Depends what the value of x is. But what are the values of x? Positives. They're greater than 1, right? Yeah. So if x is greater than 1, oh, then yeah. 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 this is definitely greater than this, right? Yeah. So then this is less than that. And so then you can do the same analysis, right? But does it necessarily matter? I mean, because when we started, you said what's the dominant for an impact. So, I mean, does the 2x, would that really have any significant impact? It does because you have to be able to make the inequalities work out. It doesn't necessarily mean that it does or doesn't converge, but you have to be able to make the uh, inequalities work out. So, like, for example, I can change this a tiny bit and make it a little bit more problematic. So like for example, let's say I just change this to um, change this to x to the fifth minus one, but then I have to, this can't be from one because it wouldn't be defined. So let's say from two to infinity. Hello. Frozen. Okay, now, um, so for values of x greater than 2, is that true? It's not true, right? This one right here, the one on the left, is actually less than square root of x to the fifth, right? So then you go, okay, well, yeah, this is fine, you know, oh, it's less than, right? And then you go, oh, okay, well then, this is greater than, right? Do you guys see the problem? Yeah, you can't prove the last part. Yeah, this doesn't help you, right? Because, so what you have is that what you're saying essentially is that you have this, you, the one that you know converges is smaller than the one you're looking for. So even though it's incredibly close, and I mean, for all practical purposes, as x goes to infinity, these are almost identical. And so um, this one is definitely going to converge, but you can't use the comparison test because this isn't the inequality that you need. This doesn't work at all because just because the smaller one converges doesn't mean that the bigger one converges, no matter how close it is. So you don't know. So this is a problematic uh, situation for sure, um, and so you you cannot say this. Um, there's another test um, called the limit comparison test, which is not in your textbook. But we use it later um, when we do infinite series. I probably won't um, do it for these, but um, here you're, you know, kind of out of luck. You know, you can maybe try to work some other things out, um, but it would involve some, you know, more work to get the inequalities to, to work out. Yeah. Um. Is the comparison test specifically for comparing to the p integral, or they're gonna, or are we going to have to find other things to compare it to? It's, you can compare it to any integral you want, but the one that makes the most sense to use is the p integral, because we know so many values for it. 
but it's any known integral that you can, uh, that you know for sure um, um, converges or diverges, depending on what you're looking for. Okay, so that situation there with uh, making it x to the fifth minus one, we would want to just use a different p integral, say x to the, or one over x to the, I don't know, to uh, x cubed, can we do that? Or? Um, you would have to be able to show it. Um, it gets a little tricky. But I would say maybe not to worry about that quite yet. Because, yeah, we don't. We'll talk more about that later, I think, better. Um, but, okay, so that gives us a good idea of how things can go wrong. Let's do, um, let's do one more so that we have, we leave with a little bit more, a little more meat in our bones. And this is going to be on the test, right? Um... The comparison test won't be on this. So up to the comparison test, or like before. So improper integrals before the comparison test. Is comparison test on exam two, or is it just? Yeah, it'll be on exam two. Oh, yeah. Um, OK, let's do, how about um, the integral from 1 to infinity of, this is a good one, 1. Minus sine x over x squared. <clears throat> so, what do you guys think? Convergence or divergence? What's your best guess? You mean x to the second power in the denominator? Yeah. OK. And that is bad because? <laughs> you <want> help? <laughs> help out Teddy here. <laughs> Okay, so the p integral, if you forget about it, so if this didn't exist, right, then that would converge, right? 1 over x squared converges. And how does the sign being there affect? Does it have a big effect, small effect, no effect? It's not going to have much of an effect at all, if any. Not much of an effect because... It's the sign function, so sign you're subtracting, it's going to just be flipping between uh, 0 and 1. Well, sine goes between one negative one and one, negative right? Negative one and one, rather, yeah. Okay, so you would expect there not to be much of an effect, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so then you go, all right, well, um, um, then you try to bound this. Um, so let's just say since uh, sine of x is always between 1 and negative 1, then what is 1 minus sine x over x squared? This is always less than or equal to what? 2 over x squared, right? Why is it 2 over x squared? That's how you're gonna get there. So if you have a, a negative one, you give you a two on the top. Yeah. So the Otherwise the bottom you, you just leave it alone, right? But the the biggest the top can be the numerator is so sine is always between negative one and one, right? So the the biggest the, the top can be would be two. And that happens when sine is negative one. So the biggest the numerator could be is two. So uh, this function is less than or equal to 2 over x squared. And is that the inequality that you're looking for? It is, right? Because you want, a, you want a larger function that converges. And this is a larger function that converges. So um, 
So let's write this down. And since um, uh, the integral from 1 to infinity of 2 over x squared dx is a convergent uh, p integral. Then the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 minus sine of x over x squared also converges, right? On reserve, running on empty. Does that make sense? Questions, questions, questions. Are you guys going to ask me about all the words? This is the most I've ever written. <laughs> I know. Okay, so ask me. Do the words need to be there? So, do the words need to be there? <laughs> yes. <laughs> they do. How much flexibility is there asking. in terms of, you know, how You should start practice. practicing because you're really going to need them when we get into series. So, this is good. Oh. Get you in the groove. So, the whole point is just to put and yes, that's what, that's what we're looking for. Okay. And, and you want to find the bound first <laughs> to find out what the maximum is. Yeah. Notice how when we do this, we don't know what it converges to, right? Just we just know that it converges. So you can't say um, what it converges to. You just know that it's less than that one. So you know you can bound it, but you don't know what. There's a definite area. Yes. It's there. I don't know what it is. But it's there somewhere. Are we going to get to the point where we can actually find out what the area is? Or is it just the whole point of being able to do that? <laughs> well, it depends. I mean, you know, if, if you can integrate it, then yes. But, I mean, if you're using the comparison test, then that's because you can't. Okay. But you can always do it numerically, right? The computer. And Go off into. So this is the integral is that we can't just integrate. Right. We can't. We couldn't integrate that right there. Yeah. That is correct. Is it the same process for the divergent one? Like yeah, it's just backwards. Yeah. I mean, the idea is the same. You just have to. Your inequality would have to be the opposite direction. And then the one that you have smaller one would have to be divergent. But the idea is exactly the same. Okay, all right. Well then, have a good night. See you uh, Thursday. Bring questions.